Oh, thank you, Fare. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here at the Scheme Workshop. Uh, I've enjoyed the Scheme Workshop for many years, and as I'll point out uh, in a few places in this talk, the Scheme Workshop has contributed importantly to a number of the intellectual ideas that underpin the work I'm going to talk about. So it's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you to Faure for inviting me, and to all of you for coming today. Before I get started, I just want to say that happy to have this be an interactive discussion. Uh, so feel free to shout out uh, your questions, except for Matthias, who has to raise his hand first. Uh, okay. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about the work that I've done over the past 11 years now on Type Bracket uh, and how that's been motivated by work that's been done in Scheme in the, the past, but really we've uh, gone forward from there and built a bunch of, I think, uh, fun and interesting things. and. We've succeeded in some places. We've succeeded less in other places. And I'll talk about some of those. And the uh, there's a, still a lot to be done in the future. But I think it's important to understand where you are, uh, where you're coming from, uh, before you go on. So, without further ado. The Scheme community needs very little introduction to the importance of dynamic languages, but as it turned out maybe 15 or 20 years ago, the rest of the wor computing world got to start experiencing all of the fun that we've been having for many years. So you get uh, systems like this one implemented in JavaScript. Uh, this is still one of the changes in the world that's I think made a really big difference via computer programs in the day-to-day -day lives of almost everyone. Um, I was using this application this morning. Uh, you get games that people play all the time that are scripted in a wide variety of dynamic languages as well. You get scientists who develop the models that they present in their research uh, by scripting with renderers with Python or data analysis pipelines with R or bioinformatics toolkits with Perl uh, or many other things. Uh, dynamic languages are now an inseparable part of how science gets done today. Um, you get uh, the world's most popular website, uh, which is fundamentally the world's biggest PHP program. Uh, and along with a lot of other big programs, but uh, they my understanding is they still have plenty of PHP lying around. Uh, and you get uh, games where individual, uh, individual games are significant enough undertakings, hundreds of millions of dollars, that it's worth building entire new domain specific languages just to build one or two of them. And of course, when you're building it, one-off domain specific language just for your one application, uh, you of course are going to choose Racket for that. Um, you get uh, pension funds that implement their accounting system entirely in Perl. Uh, Fortunately, this pension system no longer exists. Although I don't think that has to, uh, that I don't think that has to do with the pearl. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, these people have been have relocated to the Haskell workshop, uh, uh, and 
No, the, I believe that they've merged with one of the other Swedish pension funds, uh, sadly. This is the website for the merged system. Um, so you get, you've, dynamic languages are now not just the kind of system that academics talk about the scheme workshop, but powering the most important uh, systems that anyone uses today. And this quote from Larry Wall expresses nicely the power that people find in dynamic systems and why people are drawn to systems where there's a low barrier to entry, a low barrier to making changes, and an ability to quickly develop something new. Of course, whip it up is not an unalloyed good. Uh, as we've seen, uh, in the results that this has produced, we get uh, scientific papers where com bugs in programs lead to wrong results. We get um, enormous systems where it's difficult to determine whether they work or not. We get languages where highly dynamic behavior leads to security vulnerabilities, whether that's automatically deserializing and calling a val or uh, uh, allowing anyone to index into any data structure in your web page leading to immediate security vulnerabilities. Those are both real things that have happened in the kinds of highly dynamic systems that people build using dynamic languages and they're a direct consequence of the sort of freedom and dynamicity that people love about these languages. So, 11 years ago, Matthias and I set out to take the next step in a long sequence of academic work on addressing this problem. And of course, we were not the first people to think about the problem of assurance and dynamic languages. Uh, John Reynolds worked on this problem in the 60s. Uh, he, uh, for first order untyped languages. Uh, and numerous people since then have looked at type systems, analyzers, etc. But when we set out to address this problem, uh, the idea that we came up with was about migrating between pairs of languages. And in particular, we wanted to have a setup where you could migrate from a, what we thought of as a scripting language to what we thought of as a more serious and robust programming language. Um, now, this has turned out reasonably well, I think, today. And the result is a system called Type Bracket, which I was uh, able to announced to the world in that talk uh, 11 years ago. So type bracket starts with regular old racket and it adds a type system, type system that you can see here because we use the word type in the <laughs> name. Uh, so in order to migrate from one language to another, in racket all you need to do is change the language that's declared on the first line. And that power, which we'll come back to later, uh, is all that's needed to type check this program. Of course, type checking this program, which computes the Ackerman function, takes a little more effort. You have to also add some additional parentheses. Uh, and we see that type annotations uh, declare the behavior of functions that we see in our program. And of course, the key component for any system of migration is being able to do it incrementally. And doing it incrementally means we can 
migrate one or the other or all of a system of the components that make up a system because every system uh, even the monoliths that are so passe these days built up of various components that we can treat independently. So when we set out to do this we had I think a few important ideas that lay behind the way in which we constructed type bracket and that have been animating ideas for how we've thought about developing type bracket and how my group continues to work on type bracket today. And I want to talk in, in the rest of this talk about these four ideas and how we've done, how well they've worked out, and whether they what our prospects are for the future. Um, so to start with gradual typing, basic idea of integrating typed and untyped languages. Second, doing this soundly. Doing this via migration, as we just saw, changing those red boxed uh, modules to blue. And finally, developing custom type systems for our system. Now, yeah? So when you started out, do, do you have any particular goals for the user in mind? Uh, yes. yes. Uh, the goals we had, uh, uh, as good academics, our goals were 100% focused on publishing papers. No. Uh, oh, that's fine. Our, our goals for the user what were uh, I said, Matthias, please raise your hand and become angry. Uh, no, our goals for the user were really animated by our experience maintaining large bodies of software in Racket. And they were easier maintenance, easier incremental development of large existing that? systems. Why is that what you're asking? Uh, uh, that, that's the answer I was expecting. Let's put it like this. <laughs> uh, so, so we. Except, except for the publishing paper, but the, I'm trying to get beyond that. That was a joke. Yes. The experience for the user we wanted was that they would get quick feedback about changes they made to their program and how those changes would impact the rest of a large system. So, but, so your hypothesis was that types would help maintain large code bases. Exactly. Right? Okay. Yes. Uh, Still doing proof and correct. Still doing proof and correct. Yeah, uh, I think you're full of shit. Uh, I, so, I, 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 anybody in the world. Uh, so I've been, I think, uh, one, we have definitely not succeeded or even really attempted to prove this correct to the kinds of standards that I would be happy with making this a definitive claim. Second, this whole research program actually gives us a much better opportunity to look at proving this question correct or disproving it because we suddenly have the technology that allows us to make more reasonable comparisons. And third, what I've heard secondhand from people is that companies that have engaged in this migration on large scale do have data that is positive for this hypothesis, but I have only heard this second or third hand. Yeah. Um, we do what we don't. Uh, so uh, I'm sure that uh, this question is going to require far more than just some internal corporate study and is something that I hope that people continue to look at for a long time. I happen to have the fortune of spending one day with a hack group uh, where they came to us, the whole group, and they claim they have internal data that they would make accessible to outside people to prove that the type version is much easier to maintain than the other. The question is, does that generalize from PHP, right? So that, that's, that's true, I understand that. Right. But that at least one piece, if anybody is interested in actually working on humongous, I mean, well, humongous amount of data to work on this question, they're making it available. Yeah. 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 Ye
flow on itself? Because we have flow for JavaScript. Uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of hard questions here whether these results generalize across languages, how the development environment, whether it's for one person or 10,000 developers, uh, matters, uh, size of the code base, all of these things surely matter for software engineering productivity. These questions are hard to study, but uh, I hope that the people who have know the most about how to study them, work on this question. Lisa? So yeah, the more pertinent question is, does it actually help with game flow? So I found personally that it really helps to do some basic checking, like having some invariants, that it helps you gain confidence in the program, but does it really help in maintaining large scheme programs? Let's start from that, because before making the realization for other languages, because on PHP, of course it helps, because it's a crappy language, right? You know, like scheme is not a crappy language. It has really nice abstraction uh, facilities. So I have, of course, only anecdotal evidence about type racket, but the anecdotal evidence, I think, so far is positive. I have a number of people who are very happy developers of uh, using type racket and uh, write all their new code that way uh, and appreciate the precisely those benefits. Uh, I know people who've uh, wished for type racket. Certainly, uh, in many situations, it's the tool that I wish I had when developing type racket itself. Um, and for incremental uh, building up of quick uh, little programs, it's not the tool that I would uh, first turn to. For maintaining uh, large systems, it would it's very valuable. No, I think the, the whole point of gradual typing and gradually introducing it, it's a big idea on, on that racket because typically you don't want to start with the types. You want to start exploring because you know we're not customers, we're not trying to prove theories, we're trying to write working code. But you know, once you've made it into a program and it switches from script so, to program, this is, then it moves. This is indeed the hypothesis yeah. that we started with. Yeah, it's a very yeah. reasonable hypothesis. Uh, but, uh, of course, uh, we do need to actually study it to be confident. So let's talk about these four ideas. Uh, first, gradual typing. So the phrase gradual typing was actually first introduced at the Scheme Workshop uh, 2006 uh, by Jeremy Seek and Walid Taha. And uh, the basic idea is, just as we saw before, that we can have a programming language that includes both straightforward, untyped programming as well as typed programming with straightforward interoperation between them. So all we need to do is include two pieces of the program together and they will work together. Um, and of course, this means that it embeds fully untyped programming as well as fully typed programming, and you can move anywhere you want on the spectrum between them. This idea has, in the last 11 years since uh, Jeremy uh, coined the term gradual typing and we first introduced type racket at the same time, developed a few significant uh, followers. So systems like TypeScript or Hack, uh, are now used to write tens of millions of lines of uh, software um, based on the ideas of gradual typing. Integrating typed and untyped programs in the same system is now how many large-scale systems in industry are developed, a situ situation that was not the case 10 years ago. And it's, of course, reasonably popular in academia as well. There's, uh, this is the uh, papers list for the conference starting tomorrow. And there's a number of uh, gradual typing research uh, papers uh, spanning a whole variety of systems from concurrency to performance to uh, theory uh, that 
will appear at this conference. So one question is, people have been thinking about these issues and the, inter the tension between type systems and uh, untyped languages the, and wanting to integrate them for many years. Why did this suddenly work out in the last 10 years? And I think there's two big reasons for this. One is, as I s said at the beginning, the incredible explosion of different and popular dynamic languages. Uh, uh, I think John Oosterhout did a good job diagnosing why this was going to happen, in fact, before it happened. Uh, and the second is higher order contracts by Robbie and Matthias, uh, looking grumpily at me from the back row. Uh, and the, these two ideas together really made it possible to figure out what should happen when you integrated dynamic and static languages. And the third big idea is not solving the really hard problems in this space. And the hardest problem here is how can we automatically figure out whether your enormous scheme program has any type errors? And that's a hard problem. Many people and uh, have worked on this. Many papers have been published in the scheme workshop, uh, as well as other less prestigious venues, uh, <laughs> on this question. Uh, <laughs> And I think the reason that type bracket has been successful, and the reason that systems like TypeScript and Flow and Hack have also been successful is not trying to solve this problem. That, that instead, we want to allow the programmer to do somewhat more work, and in return, give them a big return on their investment uh, in terms of type checking what they ask us to type check. And not trying to analyze the rest of the system. Yeah? It can also be argued that the default problem, whether you have a type error or you're a normal skin problem, is simply unsolvable. So the, the unsolvable is... Uh, or it might be uncomputable, because you might have to have to run the problem. To so, have to of course, uh, like every system, we have to be conservative, but type bracket and every type system is also conservative. Right, right, but it puts limitations on certain things you can express and you can so, express. So, uh, indeed, I think that's part of the reason that it works is we only attempt to type check programs that can fit in a certain class of programs that we've analyzed and understand how they work rather than arbitrary programs. And uh, I'll talk more later about uh, what that class of programs is. But again, scaling down our ambitions has enabled us to go from systems that might work in principle, but fail to scale in practice and fail to provide the benefit that people really wanted to systems that are now used by thousands of programmers. So I'm going to give gradual typing an A. Uh, uh, it would be hard for uh, m me to think of other research ideas from the last 10 years that have as, had as big an impact on, actual, on programming languages today. Um, the by, sec by gradual typing, you're also including unsound gradual typing, right? Uh, I'm including, in particular, these systems. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, what's our yeah. uh, So, uh, as you can see, the next section of this talk is about soundness. Um, so, soundness was one of the things that Matthias and I, when we started uh, thinking about that paper that we presented 11 years ago, thought was most important. In fact, the technical development is really just all about the question of soundness. And when we think about soundness, I think the right way to think about it for gradual typing is to think about this theorem, which is 
usually called canonical forms. So this says that if we have some term that's of Boolean type and it produces a value, then that value is either true or false, not some other thing. And I'm sorry. I'm He's raising his hand. Uh, yes, thank you for raising your hand. <laughs> for the record, this, this is uh, not type sadness. Uh, this is canonical forms, uh, which I said. I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you corrected yourself. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad you corrected yourself, too. Uh, so. Uh, I just to canonical forms, like I said, is an important uh, corollary of type soundness, but I think uh, it's the right framework to think about uh, what type soundness means in the context of gradual typing, is thinking about uh, what the canonical forms of terms are. Of, and when we look at gradual typing, what that means uh, and what we said uh, in our paper 11 years ago is that typed modules don't go wrong and runtime errors therefore originate in the untyped modules. And when you take that canonical forms lemma, when you still have it even in the presence of gradual typing, then you can do all of these things. Optimization, for example, relies fundamentally on the idea that if you have some type, then you know what the values are going to be at that point. And therefore, you can use operations that assume that about the values. That's one of the fundamental techniques for doing everything from uh, devirtualization of dynamic dispatch to specialization of arithmetic operations uh, to uh, inline. So you can also do debugging when you have soundness. If you have an error and you know that the type system is correct, then you have immediately ruled out a huge space of the possible bugs in your program and you can focus on the other ones. You can do refactoring. If you know that all the values are going to be of a specific class, then you can use that property to rearrange how you process those elements, to uh, swap the two branches of an if in the Boolean case, which you cannot do if there's instead a wide variety of possible values that could come up. So this is, I would say, obviously the right thing for any self-respecting programming language. Unfortunately, performance. Um, performance is the reason why soundness in gradual typing has, and in many other programming languages contexts as well, uh, has failed to be adopted in practice. And the performance problems here are genuine. So if we look at this chart, which uh, takes benchmarks developed for type bracket by uh, Asumu Takikawa and a number of other people at Northeastern, we can look at slowdown factors here from gradual typing. And you'll see that they go out to 10x, and that's not so good. When your program slows down by a factor of 10 because you've added gradual typing, that seems pretty bad. Unfortunately, that's far from the worst. What this says is the percentage of benchmarks that only slow down this much. And you can see that some of these lines have not reached 100% by the time they get to 10x. And so we have while working on type bracket, managed to steadily make these lines go upwards. Um, but even the lines that are at the top here, they're not intersecting 100% at 1.1x over here, which is what you might want. 
So the different lines are different versions of type brackets? Uh, so uh, these two lines are different versions, dashed versus solid are different versions of type bracket, and blue versus red are two different virtual machines that we've worked on to improve uh, the performance of type bracket. Uh, Oh, so this is just one program. Uh, this is a wide variety of programs. We can see uh, many different programs, some of which slow down only a little bit, and some of which slow down over here to so over here. Where yeah. Is the slow down coming from? Is it because of the contracts? Uh, so exactly, enforcing things dynamically at runtime takes time, and. Uh, one of the things we've learned is that it can take a lot of time. And in particular, enforce it, enabling yourself to enforce things at runtime by adding indirections that check things inhibits optimization, increases allocation, adds indirections uh, in inner loops, and those things. Uh, all take time. I think Matthias had his hand up. Uh, we were just able to reconfirm this result to some extent on Python, particularly Python. Python. Yeah. So you have very similar curves that there. Yeah. This is not uh, the point of this chart is not to uh, suggest that we've done something uniquely wrong in type bracket. Yeah. Uh, we've. No, that's held fast to soundness, and it's had some significant performance consequences. But you would see this any other time that you attempt to build a sound, gradually typed language. And have you solved uh, the return type contract? To uh, if I recall correctly, it was killing the other cars on? Uh, so in uh, some cases, uh, Racket's contract system, thanks to work by Robbie, can avoid uh, impeding tail recursion, but uh, not in all cases. So you said what, what orange and blue are, I think? Yeah. What's black? Uh, black is uh, what you can get if you modify your program some, uh, and to add more or fewer types. Uh, oh, no, I see. Uh, and so, by a combination of Wait. improving type bracket, switching to a different uh, experimental virtual machine, and changing your program, you can get to the point where almost never do you run into a more than 3x slowdown. So, uh, okay, now that's required an enormous amount of work on a lot of people's part, and it's not sufficient yet. Which is why, if you go to Facebook, or you go to Microsoft, they are not <coughs> building sound gradual type systems today. So, but a few minutes ago, you said that this graph is representing a bunch of benchmarks, but now you've just said it's one benchmark on either two machines or with a few tweaks, and uh, or a new version of Racket. So I'm no, no, that's not what I've said. Um, What's going on here is we have a wide, large number of benchmarks, and we're looking at how many of them slow down a certain amount. Whether, the pers how, whether any of them slow down, for example, more than 3x. That's what you see here, that there's maybe 1% of them that slow down for more than 3x. That's the black line. But, OK, by a wide variety of benchmarks, do you mean a single program with different type-on-type -type configurations? So we have a bunch of programs. They have a bunch of configurations. Uh, I assume th Your problem. colleagues, uh, uh, I think we should take this offline, but suffice it to say that these are the benchmarks developed by your colleagues at Northeastern. Um, Will, you had a question. If, if you were to look at something like hack, which is unsound, what would the graph look like? Uh, the graph would uh, be a vertical line at 1. Okay. There's no runtime. Yeah, yeah. There's no runtime checks. Therefore, no changes to the types can possibly cause any slowdown or any speed up. Uh, so you'll see, for example, that these lines uh, actually go across the one x. So there are there are some programs that are faster, which also won't be the case for hack. Hack's just going to be a vertical line on this edge of the chart. Mike, you had a question. 
It's probably a stupid question, right? But um, I mean, the benchmarks are all type correct, right? So if you drop all the wrappers and the type checks, right? But presumably, I mean, you do a little bit of work where you can replace uh, type check operations by non-touching operation? Uh, yeah. So if you get below 1x? Yeah, so that's, so, so yes. So as uh, I was just saying, the these lines actually cross the 1x, so you will get some that are actually faster than 1x. So you speed up up to, up to 30% in our Yeah. So right. Which would leave out, I mean, these are 75,000 measurements, and they're up, sometimes they have 30% speed ups, but they're a smaller, smaller fraction. Yes. Yeah. But, but is there an option to leap to just not generate the wrappers? Uh, that there is, is there an option in your scheme system to that's just not, not generate the pre checks for a car? That's not yes, allowed. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, 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 no. Dropping, so, guys, dropping the type annotations is not sound. Okay. Yeah. So uh, as I think this is the same issue as having a global flag to turn off uh, pair checks in car and cutter. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you can end up in uh, a bad place with that as well. Uh, so uh, type bracket does not currently have a global switch to do either of those things. Uh, so as a result of this performance problem, we've ended up with a spectrum of uh, systems of uh, you can your axes. soundness. So, uh, 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 so the uh, yeah. So uh, here we have uh, more and less. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, more decibels, fewer decibels. Uh, so type bracket has made a strong effort to maximize the performance cost of uh, <laughs> using gradual typing. Uh, and uh, other systems, such as TypeScript, have avoided any runtime checks, as well as giving up on soundness in the purely statically typed portion of the language. And then you have a variety of systems in between, such as Flow, where they're trying to be sound in the type system, but not in the interaction. Uh, you have uh, a lot of gradual typing research that you'll hear about this week, where people avoid violating the canonical forms lemma, but do not uh, meet the criteria that we set out in our original paper for pointing to the incorrect uh, module. You have a system like reticulated Python where it's possible to get some form of accurate error checking. Um, and so there's a large spectrum here and uh, to some degree this avoids performance problems as you go in this direction but it also avoids uh, providing as useful feedback to programmers, avoids ensuring the correct that you're not doing incorrect things at runtime. So there's a variety of uh, choices that you can make here. Uh, I don't want to, I'm not going to claim that the people building industrial systems should be adopting soundness today because we genuinely don't know how to make it perform uh, in an acceptable way, but uh, I hope that this community can continue the uh, research that we've done in that direction to improve, improve this spectrum and move more things in this direction in the future. So I would give soundness a C, which is really only getting a good, as good a grade as it is because uh, I hope that in the future, uh, uh, we can uh, improve the system and because I think soundness is such a valuable feature of gradual type systems. The third big idea that I had that uh, many people here believe is migration. Migration between existing untyped racket programs and typed racket. So 
that's what we set this whole system up to do really easily. We wanted to be able to just change a few characters and uh, Slideshow makes it very easy to make this look as easy as possible. And I did a bunch of analysis about how easy this was. Other people have done analysis for other variants of type bracket about how easy this is. People have done analysis about how easy this is in reticulated Python, in uh, gradually typed small talk, in a variety of other languages. But the results are a little different. So today, if you check out all of uh, the racket distribution, I think there's 266 files written in type bracket that aren't part of the implementation of type bracket itself. Out of? Uh, a lot. <laughs> uh, so of those, two of them were ported from on type, existing on type bracket programs. So I got both of those in my Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, thanks to Robbie's dedication, this number is as high as it is. Uh, so, I didn't actually port them. It wasn't. Yeah. Uh, so, I just maintained yeah, The other 266, I mean, Neil just splits up his program into lots of files. Uh, that's <laughs> not really what's going on there. <laughs> so why did this happen? Why did, I think, our theory about how programmers would use this system turn out to just be wrong? Uh, the biggest answer is that no one wants to maintain software any more than they have to. And therefore, migrating something to type bracket, if it's not providing you with benefit right now, is something that people are not going to do. Instead, people are going to uh, write uh, the min make the minimum change they need to fix whatever bug they're dealing with and move on. The other thing that I failed to anticipate is that people want to program in the kind of language that they want to program in. Uh, and mostly they're already doing that, except lots of people wanted to program in a typed variant of Racket. And many of them were in fact not programming in the current untyped variant of Racket or not writing as much software as they would once they were given the opportunity to write typed Racket programs. And there was pent up demand for Racket but with types and that's been reflected in those other 264 programs that were written from scratch with typed Racket. And I would say the third reason is that once you're modifying something significantly enough to want to switch to a typed language, often you're going to just actually throw out the system that you've got and write a new one. In fact, one of the big piles of typed code is a port of an existing system that where in fact the existing system was entirely thrown away and a new one written in type bracket was created. Uh, so that's, uh, those are I think reasons why migration has basically not happened. I know a number of people who use type bracket for lots of programs, all programs that they're writing from scratch in type bracket because it's the programming language that they turn to when they're writing software. Um, and that's very gratifying, although it isn't the thesis that Matthias and I had when we started this. So we're going to give migration a D. So uh, Kathy's going to talk about how she has a totally different experience. Yeah. Uh, uh, my basic point is stick works better than carrot. If you force people to put the types on their programs as they check them in, they're a lot more likely to do it, and you get a lot more benefit therefore. Uh, but yeah, yeah, people won't do it unless you make them. Clearly, I should have uh, considered this option. Uh, the pre-commit hook that rejects your programs if they're not written in type bracket. Uh, I'm sure that would have increased those numbers. Uh, but uh, Yes, yes. 
Uh, yeah, so that's certainly a difference that you would see in a corporate environment versus uh, a communally run open source project. Uh, and where you can actually make global decisions about coding standards, et cetera, or, and, and provide requirements. I would say the other piece, the other piece that I haven't talked about is tooling, and tooling that can automatically help you with this process is going to make people a lot more excited about doing this, and there's, uh, my understanding is places that have made major investments in large-scale porting to gradually typed systems have, in fact, uh, added tooling that helps. Um, I'd like to supplement Kathy's answer. Uh, he's talking about flow. The hack people were quite honest that many hack, many PHP programs would not have switched. You just had to be for, you could try it into them. Yeah. Uh, I think... And that's PHP. Uh, on both sides, though. Uh, yeah. So finally, oh. I wonder about the value of migration compared to the value of interoperability. So, I mean, is interoperability then what's important? Yes. Migration? Uh, so I think uh, I think they're both important. Uh, interoperability is a key motive. Uh, key component of making migration possible. And it was migration that we sort of started with as our motivation, and that led us to interoperability. But interoperability is what enables all those other pieces of software that were not written uh, by migrating existing software to work well. So uh, interoperability is, I think migration is still valuable and people uh, at companies where they've forced people to do it, uh, I think are reasonably happy with the results. Um, but interoperability is of broader value than just in it as an enabler of migration. Uh, that the, the long-term future of Racket software, for example, is not to eventually become entirely written in type Racket. Um, the, Instead, the long-term future is one of interoperability. Uh, <coughs> finally, I want to talk about custom types. So, bracket programs uh, are not secretly Haskell programs. Uh, that's why we're here at the Scheme Workshop. Uh, and the same is true for just about every other dynamic language that you can think of. We can't just adopt an off-the-shelf static type system and make it work for our existing programs. Or even, if we abandon our ideas about migration, the programs that our existing developers will want to write. Uh, so, therefore, we've developed a wide variety of techniques for type checking the kinds of programs that bracket programmers write. And uh, you can see here, we're making use of type tests like number question mark. This is what we call occurrence typing, and it's one of the foundational pieces of how type bracket is effective. But we also have important type system features like arbitrary unions of existing types without the need to add type tags the way you'd see in ML or Haskell. We have fixed length list types, singleton symbol types, and all of those feed into the occurrence typing system as well. Uh, then we've got complicated type system features to support tricky but pervasive idioms in Racket like va variable arity and apply so that you can take existing programs that do the sorts of tricky things people do with apply and convert them to type bracket. Is that parametric or non-parametric for all? Uh, I think 
<laughs> we should, uh, that's, for this for all, that's not a really useful question. Um, we have added a large amount of type inference, although not as much as you get in a language like ML because the type system is much more complicated, but so that you can do things like this, uh, infer the quite complicated instantiation of map so that you can map the quite complicated type of the subtraction function over this list. Um, we have a very interesting type system that supports arbitrary mix-ins. Here we have a class form, which is an expression. It's the result of this function. And the superclass of it is the parameter to this function. Uh, and we can use row types and first class class types to give types to this system. Uh, so in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over a little bit of the details of occurrence typing. But the important piece is that we rephrase our type system in terms of logical propositions. And this has turned out to be an enormously powerful idea that enables us to then enrich these propositions with things like negation and uh, other logical combinators that allow us to type check things in terms of complicated predicate expressions that you see both in programs that people actually write and in the generated code that comes out of complex macro exp expansion. Uh, so you can take a tricky program like this where you have to reason about whether something is a string or not a string based on the combination of conjunctions, if expressions, and uh, predicate tests, and reason about that precisely in a logical framework. By putting together all of these pieces, you can do things like type check complicated mix-in expressions. Uh, I think this is only part of the implementation of uh, Dr. Racket. Uh, but the system provides a wide variety of uh, mix-ins, uh, which make use of those first class class types in order to work in type bracket. So we can take code like that of Robbie's that we just saw and mine it for new type system ideas that otherwise we wouldn't have come up with. So uh, type system ideas do not need to merely be handed down by logicians, but instead we can come up with them by looking at the programs that our users write, and we see new examples of this in TypeScript, in Hack, in Type Closure, uh, and it's really an exciting time to be developing type systems because we have this new source of cool ideas. Unfortunately, this is a never-ending treadmill of type system additions. Uh, racket programmers are a very inventive sort, uh, and they keep coming up with new ways to write their programs that don't work in my type system. Uh, and then they send me email about it. Um, and there's a real- Haskell did for 15 years, right? What? <laughs> the, the advantage. So Simon sent himself email. Uh, <laughs> yes. The advantage is, yeah, I think there's a real difference there, which is that Simon doesn't have any users who say, I have this program that works great but doesn't type check. There's no one, no one ever complains about their working but untyped Haskell program. Um, it's not a thing. Uh, and instead, Racket users have lots of strange ways to write programs that they then expect to work in the type system. And you can just 
keep going around this staircase and keep adding features, but that has its own drawbacks. So I'm going to give this a B plus. This, uh, this system has worked extremely well. Type bracket would not be possible without developing custom type systems. And we've come up with a bunch of cool ideas to make that work, and that's fed into new things like an integration with refinement types. But it's far from over. There's a ton of racket features that don't work in type racket that people would like to have, and there's no prospect for reaching the top of this staircase. So coming back to our four ideas, let's think about how we've done. So the basic idea that we should take typed and untyped languages combine them in the same system and make that interoperation work well and provide this as a software development approach has been enormously successful. Uh, tons of people are using this today in industry uh, and we, sh we should be quite proud of the influence that uh, this community has had on practice via that. Uh, Unfortunately, most of them are adopting this in an unsound fashion because we don't yet know how to give it to them in a sound fashion while meeting all of the goals uh, that they also have in particular performance. But there's other uh, reasons uh, that this is challenging as well. Uh, in settings where you can't force people to do things, migration has not turned out to be a popular approach. Instead, there's lots of people who just want to write typed versions of their software in the languages they already know and like. And all of this requires the creation and maintenance of new custom type system ideas for the particular language, but uh, this is a treadmill that you can't get off and that results in a real trade-off between increasing coverage of the language as it exists and evolves, and increasing complexity of the type system that you have to maintain, and more importantly, explain to users. Uh, so I think these four, I, some of them have worked, some of them have not, uh, but there's a lot of prospect for improvement, I think, in all of them in the future. And I want to leave you with four other ideas that we've thought about. So one, uh, taking type systems and building them via the metaprogramming system of the programming language, uh, which we originally reported on for Type Racket here at the Scheme Workshop 10, ten years ago um, with Ryan Culpepper. A uh, second big idea that's been really important to type bracket, but not widely adopted outside of it, is using existing contract systems. Uh, racket has a very rich and powerful existing contract system to implement the gradual typing system. This has had benefits. Robbie's done a great job building a very powerful system that I can just use. It also has drawbacks. The system is much more powerful than the type checks that I need, and therefore there's uh, ways in which this makes performance trickier to achieve. And so there's there's a trade-off here, uh, but we haven't. Uh, it's not been as well explored as maybe it should be. Another topic that I think has not gotten enough attention is how we integrate type systems with education. And one of the big ideas that we in the Racket community have pushed over the last uh, 20 years is levels of languages for teaching programming. But how do you produce levels of type systems that 
enable pro people to learn programming without immediate exposure to the complexity of the full type system. And type brackets complexity is not appropriate for middle school programmers. Um, this is something that we have not yet figured out the answer. And finally, how precise do we want to make our types? For example, many dynamic languages provide quite complex standard library functions that say that do a wide variety of overloaded things. And we can try to give a precise accounting of exactly that behavior, or we can try to give a more general accounting that's simpler but leaves out some things or does not reject some programs that will error. And what the right trade-off is in that space is one that I think needs, to, needs further exploration before we know the right answer. In type bracket, we've gone the maximally precise route, usually, but there's a lot of other points in this spectrum. So, with those additional questions for the next many years of gradual typing research. Thank you. We have a few more minutes for questions, so. Mike? So you mentioned that you wouldn't use type bracket to quickly cobble something together, right? Of course, it has only ML people do that all the time, right? And I would argue that they do, I mean, they leverage the types to do that, right? If you go to like CUFP, you will, to the chagrin of Phil Water, you would have people tell those stories that they write, you know, 70 parameter functions that are difficult to get right in dynamically typed language, but there are no trouble at all. In a, in a static type language. Uh, I am skeptical. Huh? I, I am. I am skeptical that anyone is getting seventy parameter functions right, regardless of their programming language. That's right. uh, <laughs> yeah. That their judgment, having never programmed in that language. Yeah, I would say the reason that if you're an OCaml programmer, you write all of your programs in the typed version of OCaml even when there are initial scripts, is because there isn't an alternative to the typed version of OCaml. I, I, it matches my experience, let me say that, right? So what, what, is, there, is there a significant, can you pinpoint the difference between OCaml and type bracket that would not make you want to cobble something together? The existence of untyped bracket is yes. the difference. Yes. Uh, yeah, the, that is wrong. Uh, so yeah. uh, I think the, yeah. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jay? <laughs> Jay? <laughs> so I think something that is on Mike's side is that when I talk to high school programmers, something that they really like is the exhaustive pattern matching where, it will, where they, the type system basically gives them a little to-do list. And that's a, that's a concrete thing that type bracket does not have that I think is a reason why it might be nice to write a small program in high school for type bracket. This type track is going to do less for you to help you fill in your program. Yeah, and that's ultimately uh, a consequence of type brackets being designed around working with uh, the idioms that people program in untyped bracket with, which makes it much, people do not write data type declarations up front, and therefore things like exhaustive pattern matching are much trickier. Uh, Will, you had a question? Yeah, if you could go back in time to when you first started this project, is there one piece of advice that you would give your younger self about what to do or what not to do? Don't. Uh, do more type inference. Uh, so the, and I would say that in for two reasons. Uh, so the reason, uh, one reason is Everyone loves type inference because they do less work. Um, and everyone loves doing less work. But the other reason that's particularly important uh, for type bracket and for this community is macros. And one of the things that's hard to do in type bracket is figure out what to do if you have a macro that produces code that is hard for the type system to understand. And often it can be hard for the type system to understand merely because it's missing some t easy to write down type annotations. But those type an the program is generated and so there's no place to write your type annotations at all if you're the client of that macro. And 
stronger type inference uh, would make a lot of macro-generated programs easier to type check. Last question. Tom? Uh, would there be any value in allowing optional unsoundness in type bracket for the sake of uh, pedagogical languages? So that would that allow any flexibility for people to write real programs but with simpler type systems and learn type systems? So that's an interesting idea that I have not considered previously. I can't think of why soundness would be the barrier to writing better pedagogical systems, but uh, perhaps it's uh, something that would help. Okay. Well, thank you all very much.